So with that, without further ado, I'm going to choose Ross Faith. Ross Faith is the CEO and co-founder, I believe. Right? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, co-founder of Spectrum FX. Promote, I just promoted him, and uh, they do fire suppressant software for reactive metal types like lithium ion. I'll let him go into it. Give him a warm welcoming hand. Yeah, so like uh, Alex said, we are Spectrum FX. We presented in January 2014, um, and uh, we are a fire safety company. We sell a fire suppressor solution for reactive metal fires, like lithium battery fires. Um, so the team, the founding team, is just me and my father. My father's a commercial airline pilot. And the first opportunity we really pursued for the last few years has been the threat from lithium battery fires in commercial aviation. Um, personal electronic device fires uh, that catch fire in the cabin of an aircraft. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of the opportunity as we saw it then. Um, the, you know, sort of the first, uh, our initial strategy, um, and then how that opportunity has evolved and what our approach is now. So this is our first product, it's called the Life Kit. It's a, we, we sell a liquid, an aqueous based agent um, that is rated class D, which means in the fire world that it will put out a reactive metal fire that burns it. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, these types of fires are, are reactive because if you put water on it, um, they explode. Um, and so our product doesn't cause explosions. It's much safer. Uh, it's been EPA qualified to replace Halon. Halon is a gas agent that has all sorts of toxic ramifications for the environment for people. Um, so our product is much safer and uh, extinguishes these fires um, quickly and safely. So this is the number of, this, this number grows every year, but this is an F FAA data on uh, events involving batteries in the cabin, uh, not necessarily fires that took down planes, uh, but these are self-reported by the airlines since 1991. So uh, you probably heard this more in the context of large containerized shipments of lithium batteries or the auxiliary power unit in the 787 that caught fire uh, on the runway in Boston. Uh, uh, see, I think it was in the Olive Pond Airways or a Japan Airways airline or Japan Airlines. Um, and so it's, the, the threat's been identified in the cargo, but it exists in the cabin too. Um, our initial strategy was to start with the cabin uh, because getting into the cargo bay of airlines was, we thought was a much uh, longer path, would involve, would involve a lot more regulation. We found a way that you could fit uh, our products into, into the existing procedure. So my father's a pilot for American Airlines. Our beta customer was American Airlines, still is American Airlines. Um, we had no idea that it was going to take as long to get through the regulatory process just in the cabin. Um, so we were then going to move into the cargo uh, opportunity. The old procedure um, was to do to use Halon, which is this gas agent that just disperses everywhere, uh, to knock out the flame followed by water to cool it or a non-alcoholic liquid like a Coke. Um, and we said, and we have said for years now, and uh, Others in the international community have said that's not the recommended procedure. You shouldn't use water even on a, on a fire as small as a cell phone fire because it's reactive. There's no international consensus on these types of fires, but the international community has evolved around using water because that's what the FAA and a couple of people in the FAA said, and water is free. Um, and so the industry generally will do the minimum standard and not much more. Uh, we've convinced a handful of commercial airlines uh, not yet our beta customer to use uh, this, even though it goes above and beyond the minimum standard. Um, but the FAA has, has kind of shifted their position in the last couple of years. They ran this crazy test where they threw water on a coffee machine, basically, a hot plate, and they said, well, water cools just as well as fire vane. Um, that's, that took us a long time to court, sort of um, undermine or to answer. We did, and they, they actually changed the, the procedure in um, 2014, the end of 2014. The procedure now says water, a non-alcoholic liquid, or an aqueous-based fire, fire extinguishing agent. And so they specifically included, we don't, we're not really aware of any other aqueous-based fire extinguishing agents that are being used in this context. So we were the only one, and that was in December. Uh, it did make a difference, but you know, it's, it's still just been a very long process. Uh, breaking into that into that space. So there was a change in the advisory circular. Um, 
in the meantime, sort of while we're waiting for the rest of the industry to come along, we've, we've both pivoted and we've persevered in our, in our current segment. So the first thing we've done um, is we've, we've moved to the business aviation world where the sales cycle is way shorter and people make decisions much quicker. They're not looking just towards what their peers are doing or what the industry stand, minimum standard is. You know, as somebody who's flying a Learjet is looking to have the, the thing that makes them the most safe. And so we've had a lot more success and a lot quicker um, in the business jet world. It's just a much smaller market. Um, we've also started to uh, attract a few customers outside of aviation. So um, we've sold to a copper mine that has a significant um, steel melting business uh, in, in Zambia. And so we've had a number of customers in the steel industry who have approached us over the last uh, six months to, to year. So we've, we've moved into this area too. So the customer profile is, is somebody who has fires that are not controllable by traditional agents like water. The, the only other alternatives they really have are these massive uh, dry chemical like sand or salt to put out these type of fires and uh, they're not nearly as practical. Um, and then we continue to pers you know, persevere in the commercial business so we're still talking to the same, some of the same set of beta customers. Uh, we've been working with them since the beginning on um, you know, regulatory approval, getting, you, they basically want, they basically make decisions by consensus. And so nobody wants to be the first to buy a new product if it hasn't been specifically listed on products that the FAA approves. So even though our product is approved or it's, it's accepted, you know, we don't have an endorsement from the FAA. And so getting that first big, you know, huge commercial airline customer to, uh, to buy has been the key challenge in our business since all that, uh, all the, the stuff with the FAA happened. We're also in conversations with a large um, OEM, an original equipment manufacturer, uh, to outfit planes with uh, cargo systems. So we've started to make the move to the cargo uh, opportunity in the last you know six months instead of just sort of waiting to get into the cabin and then going to the cargo. The other thing that's happened or transpired since we started is that essentially there are not uh, Passenger airlines, at least in the United States, are no longer shipping large shipments of lithium batteries because it's so dangerous. Um, and so uh, the only large containerized shipments of, of lithium batteries are being flown on UPS and um, uh, FedEx large uh, cargo carriers. Um, the, the OEMs actually are warning people not to ship lithium batteries in the cargo bay of planes at all. So I don't even know in, in two years how lithium batteries are going to be shipped. If they're going to have to go by rail and train or or what, but um, you know it, this is an evolving threat. It's something that's being taken very seriously. The cargo and the cabin opportunities are sort of very different opportunities, but um, we're moving into the the cargo space, which is going to be a lot bigger um, opportunity. So let's see with that, I will for question. All right, so we're going to take some questions now, so get our attention so we can get you on the mic. There's one right here. Um, and uh, and um, if you have a, OK, we got another one here. Hey, Ross. Uh, so I was wondering if you guys have looked at like some of the smaller players, like more David versus Goliath with like Gulfstream or some of the more private uh, plane you know, type applications, or if you guys have been focusing mostly on, you know, big airlines. So, the, like the manufacturers, or the, so we haven't really focused on, this is mostly an after, aftermarket product, um, so uh, the right people to talk to generally are flight departments, or the chief pilot of a corporate fleet, so, you know, uh, Dow is a customer of ours, and they have a few jets. Um, they're just mid -sm much smaller bunches. Um, the, the company that made the, the product that owns the IP had um, developed, and I didn't go into that. I mean, there's a lot of things I could go into with their business. I didn't even discuss the intellectual property. Um, but the, uh, the uh, one of the other companies that's been selling this product um, sold the uh, systems, developed tests, systems for test aircraft for, it was either Cessna or Gulfstream. 
you know, that's just sort of a one-off thing. It's not very, it's not very scalable or repeatable. Um, they didn't make a whole lot of money doing that. So the business jet space is a lot more fragmented, um, a lot less money, a lot less lucrative, like sort of in terms of market size. But the sales cycle is way shorter. And um, like you said, it's a David and Goliath thing. The, the, the Goliaths of the world are uh, incredibly risk averse to making new purchases. Add on to that, you know, the customer that we chose to start with went bankrupt, reorganized. Like we we dealt with probably you know, ten different people over the last three or four years over there. So, all right, and there's a question in the middle here. Yeah. So you said these mining companies actually found you and were interested in your product. How did you get to them? I mean, what was the the path to product awareness or uh, out of the market? You know. So I'd say like luck, luck mostly. Um, uh, they, uh, I guess I should do a little backstory on the IP. The company that um, developed this product, this product has been developed for years. It's been some scientist in the 90s developed the agent, and then it's, it's changed hands. It's changed ownership quite a few times over the years. But we're the only one that we're aware of really distributing it right now. Um, so they, the, the company that uh, owned that owns the IP had that business, um, and the folks that wanted that product. There was a couple of people that had been existing customers of theirs. Found us on the internet. So, all right. Question. Question in the back. So, hey. So, very cool journey. You've been at it for a while. We started this conversation some weeks back, but what have been kind of your struggles or thoughts and deliberation on? The, in your words, the pivot or persevere, uh, given the length of your journey and what you've run into. Yeah, I, I, I think I wouldn't recommend anyone knowing nothing else about an opportunity going straight into a heavily regulated industry as a startup. Um, that has been probably the biggest challenge for our business. Um, not only because you really you have to have the regulator as a customer in a sense too, you have to have their approval, but also because. Everybody sort of makes decisions based on a minimum standard of what's actually required by a regulator and by consensus. Um, so I think that was probably, it, it makes it difficult to say, well, the, the feedback we're getting is that they don't like the product. Well, that's not really true. We're getting a lot of feedback from a lot of different people that this is a great product and this is a serious threat. Um, but you, we spent two years basically trying to get FAA approval. Got acceptance or approval, and then and now we get to and now we get to address the market issues, and so uh, it, I think it, because it's difficult to separate those two things, the timeline isn't like sort of it's it's not amenable to lean startup in the same way that you know uh, a tech startup is. I think it's it's like the same. It's probably similar to what people go through. The biotech industry goes through with FDA approval. You've got a blockbuster cancer drug, you know there's a market for it, but it takes like seven years to get through clinical trials. So, um, and you may go belly up at the end of you know phase three of the trial or something. So. Another question here in the middle. So you said something that triggered a uh, idea there. So this distribution you're doing for this third party that created them, do you have any type of uh, barrier to entry? You go through all the work, you get it unregulated, you get it sold. Uh, does another company line up to sell this guy's stuff? Do you have any type of exclusive? We have a we have a distribution agreement that has some level of exclusivity. Um, yeah. Uh, where is it manufactured? Uh, in Tulsa. In Tulsa, yeah, the company that manufactures it. We don't do that part. We do assemble the kits. Um, that happens in our office with the two of us right now. So. Um, but the manufacturing of the agent is, is done here in Tulsa. Okay, got a question right here. Was there any difficulty in kind of getting into international markets with export import type stuff? Uh, how, how much of a learning curve was that or is that something that you guys outsource or hired on or how did you handle dealing with that? Yeah, there's a, there's a huge learning, that's a great question, there's a huge learning curve uh, if you are a startup. Where, like most of our customers have been international initially. And you know, export compliance isn't something you want to take that lightly. Um, you don't want to accidentally sell your products to uh, North Korea or something like that. Um, so 
it took, it took we you know, went to, the, the state of Oklahoma has a lot of great resources to help, you know, um, people who know nothing about this area uh, to do it, uh, to learn it. And Oklahoma State's International Trade Group does seminars with the, the U.S. Department of Commerce. But it's, it's been taking a long time. Uh, we work with the freight forwarder now. They help us, but you still have to learn this, like, archaic government system for um, making a, an export filing. And you've got to go through your, your export compliance checklist and make sure that, you know, it's not a banned party. It's, it's a bunch of different things. But it is like a, it is kind of a learning curve for people because the, pe the other people who were in that seminar were like in the freight department of a company and that's all they do all day is they do international orders and they go through the export checklists. So just another thing, another thing you have to learn as a, as an entrepreneur. And um, I have a question over here. Yeah. Can you talk more about the hoops that you have to jump through uh, and uh, after you, you do get that approval and some of the competition or, or things that, uh, the tasks that they have you do once you get that approval? Uh, you mean like, so we got approval in December 2014, so now what are the problems facing us in terms of competition, correct, and market? Yeah, so there's a lot of people that are, I mean, primarily the competition is water because it's free. Um, and that's what they're using now, and it's the minimum standard. Um, it hasn't been that difficult to convince flight departments that we can get in front of that throwing water on a fire that will blow up when you throw water on it is bad. Um, it's surprising how hard that's been to convince airlines of that. <laughs> Which shouldn't make you feel that secure, but uh, you know there have been a, there have been a few other competitors in the space. One of them is this company called Plane Guard, and they make a steel case. And you should watch the video sometime. It's insane. They make a case and it sells for like six thousand dollars, something like that. And they have like a flight attendant putting their putting gloves on and picking up a flaming laptop and putting it in the case and then extinguishing it. So I mean, there are like a there's a range of crazy stuff going on in this space, and I think that's part of the hesitation from the airlines for accepting a lot of the, any new innovations. Um, you know, my dad says, like, firefighters aren't trained to pick up a burning car and then go put it out somewhere else. Like, you know, you, you put out a fire first. But, so that's, you know, there are a handful of other uh, products, and actually we, sell, we, we co-market a product it is a disposal solution for after the laptop's caught fire. It's called the air, the, the fire sock, and it's a flame retardant bag. But they don't, they don't propose this as a solution to putting the fire out, just as, to disposing with this, you know, device. So water actually only works to put out one of these fires by accelerating the uh, the burn and burning the fire out, or causing it to burn itself out. So that's that's why it works. Got time for a couple more questions? That is a quick question. Uh, yes. How, much, how many instances are there with cars that have the lithium batteries catching on fire at the start of yeah. oh, Cars that, uh, what are the incident rate of cars catching on fire? And would this be something a fire department would have to have if they came yeah. upon a uh, Leaf or a Tesla? So, like, a, yeah, I mean, it would have to be sort of a reactive metal fire. It's difficult to sell the product to people that can use water freely when water's adequate, you know, like, you're not going to find a fire, you know, a normal um, fire truck full of fire main, which is the product, uh, and, you know, pouring on a house fire. It'd just be way too expensive. But it would be on, you know, on a hazmat vehicle, so hazardous materials. Um, to your specific question, I don't know the numbers on that. We haven't tracked it. We've, 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 put, we've dipped our toes into the uh, Tesla waters a little bit. Um, most of the problem is that they are, they're not interested in acknowledging that their cars are a fire risk um, or that the you know, multi-billion dollar facility building massive combustible batteries is a problem. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's sort of a, a, a can of worms we haven't, just the two of us haven't been really willing to open up just quite yet, but um, it's not insignificant. I, I haven't heard of a high-profile case like you know a Yugo style case or somebody's uh, Tesla caught fire yet, but and that's the problem. I mean, you know, it's it's a catastrophic risk. There hasn't been a plane that you know, carrying passengers has gone down. There have been plane, there have been two cargo planes that have killed pilots that were carrying shipments of batteries, and 
there's going to be, I, I forget the numbers in terms of loss over the next 10 years, but they're expected to lose like one every two years. And that's like an acceptable risk in that industry. You know, they're, they're only carrying pilots. Unfortunately, if, you know, there's not enough people for them to be, that, be as concerned about it if it's going to cost, you know, it's sort of a very um, concrete cost-benefit analysis that's going on right now. But Question right here. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your funding and your, your runway? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So we were funded early on by I2E and an angel investor. Um, and that funding we've mostly spent. Um, we're surviving largely on sales now. Um, and, you know, we don't have a runway that lasts forever. That's, that's about sort of the extent of that. But, um, yeah, we, we've had a, this year has been a better year for us than other years because we've pivoted to like, you know, more uh, immediate opportunities than just waiting for the one big fish. I think our goal, our sort of our, our, our thought process is we're still going after the couple of big fish um, at the same time that we're going after fish that are much easier to catch that can fund operations while we're waiting for the Boeing or the American. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, ask you our final question, which is, what can the One Million Cups community do for you? So I, I think this is maybe not in the next, you know, uh, month, but over the course of the next three to four months, we're looking for outside sales reps to do work in some of the industries we don't have as many um, contacts. So I don't know what the model will be like yet, but you know, a manufacturer's reps may not not works in the chemicals business and sells a portfolio of products. Um, not necessarily a distributor, so if you know anybody who does that here in this area, um, maybe the oil and gas business is probably people who sell uh, you know, components to the oil and gas business. And they work in the safety business. That is something we're going to be interested in over the course of the next few months. All right.